it's very it's very moving. It's very moving. And that's that's a great example because it's a, it, the idea of writing a song about James Gay Polk is very funny, but the yeah. song itself is just sincere. Yeah. Uh, Evan, when you were writing for like you you've written songs for SpongeBob, for example. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, if you if you don't think you know Evan, you know Evan. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and that seems like another example of the the context of it is. Humorous because obviously it's an ambulatory, ambulatory talking sponge. Right. Um, to begin. Um, but when you are writing the songs themselves, are you necessarily like hunting for the joke? Well, in in the case of SpongeBob's, it very depends on show to show what my involvement is. In their case, a lot of times I'm not even writing the lyrics; they give them to me. Right. Some of them I am writing the lyrics. They'll just go, "Hey, we need a song about uh, Mr. Krabs feeling old," so I wrote a song about him being old. I remember that song. That so that's one of the ones I did write lyrics for. And that one is just sort of, they, they already have the situation, they actually already have it boarded. Right. And you have to fit it within that. Right. And a lot of times it's even with the lyrics, which can be very difficult, because uh, some people give you lyrics and you go, oh, wait, there's four lines and they rhyme. Some of them are like, okay, two rhyme, and then there's one, and then there's uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> so then you have to figure out a way through it. Um, so it really depends on what your sort of assignment is, how far you're reaching for jokes. SpongeBob, in, the, in that particular show, I don't have that much freedom in terms of what, I'm not really coming up with a joke in terms of it's already boarded and I'm either elaborating on it. But um, I did a show called Drawn Together and that was one where wow. they kind of let me just go. No kidding. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> You have guts applauding the most offensive show on television. Uh, and I, I guess I have guts admitting I wrote all those songs and lyrics and tapped into that punk rock idiot. Oh my god! To be juvenile and scatological and obnoxious. And on that one, they, they asked me when I first got it, do you want to write lyrics? Or I can I do it both ways, whatever you guys want. And they go, why don't you write a couple and we'll see. So, um, I wrote, uh, they had a couple lyrics started for uh, uh, Black Chick's Tongue, and, uh, and another song, they said, we just need a, a peppy tune uh, in this episode that has a monster vagina, so I wrote a song called La 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 Labia. <laughs> so I thought, okay, you can write the lyrics. And so, just, so there, it was, it, was, uh, it was a matter of just being silly and obnoxious and tapping into that punk rock sense, and trying to make the guys laugh, which was really fun too, just, that's, that was kind of a rare circumstance for me, where there was less filters of, I just kind of let them deal with any network issue. <laughs> so, they were doing it so much anyway, they were pushing it on so many other things, I figured, well, how bad can I be? All right, I just want a whole shit sandwich, go ahead, <laughs> see if that floats. <laughs> so you'd be like, here's your song, your problem now. Yeah, that one they actually wrote back an email that just said, shit sandwich, question mark, shit sandwich, and they kept it, I think, as long as, then it actually got cut not for content. <laughs> just didn't have time for it. Just didn't have time for it? Yeah, yeah. So you could, like, release that as a single. Yeah, I think it's on there, they did put out a CD of that, and it's such a comedy story, it was a little, uh, they, the guys were always talking to me about, oh, we'll put this all out as an album. So I was like, let me know, because some of these should be remixed and fixed, because you know it's a really quick schedule. And then of course the way stuff goes with, with corporate world and let's get it going now, it was like it was done before I even knew what? Oh, that shouldn't have been oh, There's stuff that should have been cut together and there's a lot of little things that it is what it is. But yeah. Paul and Storm over on the end, you guys also uh, wrote a, a raft of songs. Uh, for your YouTube series, um, and let's talk about. If that's about the right amount of applause. Give it a Let's talk a little bit about the writing the songs specifically in the context of uh, uh, of an episode. Well, that was really a stretch. It, uh, the series Learning Town was a yeah, music yeah. comedy web series. Look it up. It's real good. <laughs> Also, I'm just here. I would have to shout out uh, written uh, the script written by our friend Josh Kagan. You hear Josh? Woo! And, so it was actually a bit of a stretch for us. We're accustomed to writing joke songs, songs that are designed to get the laugh, and that's pretty much what they do. 
Um, some of them have a little more emotional content, and with Learning Town, uh, it was more difficult because we were trying to get a laugh and also have them serve the purpose of the plot. Yeah. So it wasn't just going for a joke, and it was within the context of the show, which in a lot of ways makes it easier. Edwin was talking about if you're given the lyrics or a prompt that then um, that that you or other people have agreed is funny, then then it's okay, go and you go with it. And so in that way, I kind of found that was more fun in some ways, where you weren't sitting over your keyboard thinking, come on, think of a funny idea. Uh, but it was already there, so it was just a matter of carving it out of the block of granite. It's definitely granite. What he said. <laughs> Maybe marble, sometimes it was marble. Sometimes it was marble, sometimes it was granite. Um, yeah, I, I, mean, I don't have too much to, to add to that. It certainly was an added level of difficulty because, you know, when you're when you're writing a song for a musical, you know, one of the old saws about it is that the reason a song should be in a musical is because the characters have no choice but to bur burst into song because you're expressing an emotion in a way that can't really be expressed just by speaking. Uh, and while we were both fans of musicals, we had no real experience writing that. And it was a very steep learning curve trying to find songs that could A, be funny and interesting, B, somehow move the plot forward, or if they're not doing that, at least C, doing that expressing of an emotion in a musical form and in an effective way. Uh, and it was hard. And oh, and also, it's got to be short because every episode is no more than eight minutes long. <laughs> Which, as it turns out, was about five minutes too long. <laughs> Um, Molly, I'm going to ask you uh, specifically. Well, I think one of the one of your mm, uh, best known songs, not necessarily one of your best songs, but one of your best known songs. Although there's nothing wrong with the song, I'm going to shut up. Stop talking. It's the it's the, it's the Stephen Fry song. Oh sure. Okay. Um, it's okay. <laughs> I'll give you some time for applause. This is all okay. Um, Talk a little bit about uh, the uh, the idea of a writing a song that is a about someone. Sure. Uh, that it b finds its uh, finds that person and c uh, that you get to sing it for that actual person. Sure. Um, well, that song it came about because I well, there's this whole story. I was um, dating a guy at the time who was, you know, sort of had his own opinions about what I could do with myself. And at some point I was like pushing that boundary one day and I was like, what if we had like a friend who couldn't could, like conceive a child, could I have their baby? And he was like, no, that's weird. And I went, what if it was like a gay couple that couldn't have a baby? And he was like, no, that's not good either. And I went, what if it was Stephen Fry? And he went, yes. <laughs> you would have to do that. <laughs> and we ended, up, we ended up breaking up and I was like, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna proposition Stephen Fry, jerk. And so... <laughs> And so I, I wrote this song, and the song's called An Open Letter to Stephen Fry, and I structured it to be as much like a letter as possible. Okay. You know, there's sort of an opening paragraph about like, listen, so here's your deal. I have an idea. Uh, I have a proposition for you. And it sort of tri I tried to develop the idea in sort of paragraph forms, as you would in a letter. And ultimately that letter got delivered to him. Um, because I, I was workshopping it like actively at Woodstock, and the song developed over a series of Woodstocks, and it got passed on to him somehow, got passed on to some people at Harvard who were like, hey, uh, we're having Stephen Fry over next week, uh, so if you can get yourself to Boston, you can play it for him, and that would be pretty great. And I went, yes, okay, we'll do that. Um, and were it not for the muscle memory of playing that song at Woodstock so many times, I would have just barfed, I wouldn't have gotten through it. <laughs> but that was an odd experience, because usually when I played that song, like, there are, a lot, there are some comedy songs that you really need to kind of preface with, like... So the story of this song is it's about, you know, a scientist who lives on a mountain, or it's about, you know, Mr. T becoming my life coach, or whatever the song's about. <laughs> and in this one show, where I was singing to Stephen Fry at this award ceremony, I couldn't necessarily take the audience into my consideration. Like, for the one time that I've ever played that song, I had to address it directly to the person it was about. And it completely threw off my, my mojo. Because I'm used to being like, hey, who knows who Stephen Fry is? And in a room of people celebrating him, obviously, that kind of goes um, it, it was sort of uniquely nerve-wracking, because I've, I've written a couple songs about living people, and as far as I know, Stephen Fry is the only one who has heard the song of which he is the subject. 
I don't think Mr. T has heard his Mr. T song. <laughs> I don't think Lisa Nowak has heard the Lisa Nowak song. I would certainly like to find out if she has. <laughs> um, I don't know if that answers your question. No, it does, it does. And that actually brings up, uh, not necessarily uh, a person per se, but um, one, of the, one of the uses of comedy or one of the uses of, uh, uh, in, in songwriting is often to talk about uh, contemporary subjects or to, to make a point uh, through satire or something along that line. Uh, one of your new songs, Jonathan, is about the guy who feels brave about being on the line uh, and so on and so forth, when in fact he's just a dick. Right. That's right. That's right. Okay, gold, gold star for skulls. Yeah, you got it. You got it. Well done, But let's talk about that. I mean, in the sense of writing something that is satire or is meant to be commentary, commentary um, what's, do you worry about pushback? I mean, it was entirely possible that Stephen Fry could have possibly been in I was prepared for him to punch me. I really was. Yeah, right, exactly. She did. When you are writing something that is uh, meant to very specifically comment on a uh, particular topic, do you worry about the repercussions or are you just focus on the song right then and there? No, I, I mean, yeah, it's, I feel like it's impossible these days to write anything that you plan to publish and not worry about repercussions. Uh, that's one of the current problems with the internet. Um, uh, but I, I think that, you know, at, at its best, the job of songwriting is to kind of be fearless and to be able to uh, express something, you know, especially when you're writing from, like that, that song's a good example because it's, you know, it's an unreliable narrator situation. It's this guy describing his very obviously flawed perspective about how he's a sort of misunderstood genius and everybody else is an idiot and he's the only one who knows uh, how everything should be. Uh, and yet he's also he's also terrified and self-loathing and realizes that he's he's uh, talking himself into a life of loneliness and <laughs> and but you know that's the that's the power of that kind of song is that it's uh, you're taking the perspective of this character who is a flawed person but in order to do that correctly you have to be fearless about saying some things that are kind of dickish and. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a thing that I worry about in the back of my mind is that I'm going to sing a song like that and somebody's going to, and it does happen all the time, people mistake the singer for the song. Right. Uh, Just ask Randy Newman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. He, he writes a lot of unreliable narrator type songs and he, people tend to think that he hates short people or whatever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so yeah, it is, it is a tricky thing, but I think you, you know, it's, if you shy away from it, then the song is not going to be as good. If you're writing about a character who is ugly, uh, then you have to be as ugly as you can possibly be to make it believable and true. Well, I think with, with comedy and any kind of storytelling, too, like I saw, there's this um, interview I saw with Stephen Sondheim where they were saying, like, oh, well, you're a poet of sorts, and he went, no, I'm not, I'm a lyricist, and there's a difference. Because with a poem, you kind of expect that people will, you know, they'll kind of walk themselves through it, they'll read back over bits they didn't understand. And if you're going to tell a story or try and convey an idea through poetry, you have to kind of let the, the reader go on their own journey. But with lyric, you have control over the order in which they process the ideas, and you need to build in time for them to sort of reflect on certain larger ideas. And that services like that kind of story, like unreliable narrative storytelling really well, and it serves comedy really well. Like you couldn't really, I know people write comedy poems, that's totally a thing, but you can sort of uniquely get the drop on people when you write funny songs. Like, I feel like drop rhymes don't work in poems because you go, oh, she, she didn't rhyme, she rhymed something with crotch, but it seemed like she was gonna rhyme with another word. You know, like, you can build in, like comedy's all about timing and the lyrics allow you to play with that timing so much. Does the uh, uh, musician and lyricist of Ship Sandwich have anything to add to this particular discussion? <laughs> Well, I think there is the whole other element too that, you know, there is the lyrical element yeah. where I, I may be making it stray a little bit, but the musical element itself can be funny too. Yeah, absolutely. And so, um, but I'm kind of str straying from the whole... No, no, um, expand, expand, expand. With the, okay, okay. Because, um, yeah, a lot of times when I'm giving lyrics, of course, I don't get to contribute to that and how can I support it musically? And, but that affects the timing and, and, and all of those things, the rhythm of it. There are ways to make a, a lyric that in itself may not even be that funny, and then it becomes really silly if you do some musical twist on it. Um, 
I was just working on a thing the week before coming here where uh, it's a Hall & Oates song that's like supposed to be a long lost Hall & Oates song for a thing. I can't name what it is. But, um, but one stupid thing in the, in the thing is this little hand clap that keeps happening. <laughs> and it just started making us laugh more and more. It's like the hook of the song. It's this hand clap. It has nothing to do with the lyrics or anything else. <laughs> so it's just an example of how the music itself can be funny, and it's, and it's actually a very important element, um, depending on what type of music it is. I mean, when you're doing, a, if, you're, if the song is just you and a guitar or whatever, that's, that's one way, but when you're producing it, when it's gonna be something that's got arrangement, um, like one thing I learned a lot, I was working with Garfunkel Notes a lot. Um, I don't write for them, but I arrange for them and, and produce some of their stuff, and um, one thing we would stumble on is, uh, a lot of times you get a great melodic idea in the arrangement and it can distract from the lyric and be like, ah, oh, that sounds great. And it's again, getting back to your very original thing of, is it a good song and then it's funny? There's a lot of stuff that makes a really great song and if, and if the song we were working on wasn't supposed to be funny, you'd put that part in because it's cool. But then when it's in there, you're kind of like, you're, you're, focus is taken off of the lyric and you want to get that rhythm, you want to get that, you set it up a way and then that rhyme switch happens or whatever and if you distract the focus from that, that can be a, that makes it less funny. So you're talking, you basically talking about editing. Yeah. yeah, it's it's editing and just having your arrangement is servicing the comedy of it. If it's strictly a comedy song, kind of getting back to something you said earlier, there is a thing too of there's full on comedy songs in the comedy section of the store. You know what I mean? And then there's songs that are funny that are like on somebody's album that are funny that it's not in a comedy context. So I'm talking about the ones that are really like, this is all about it has to be super funny. And that's the main purpose of this song. So in that case, your your actual surrounding music has to cater to that. And you have a lot of uh, things you can, tricks and fun that you can pull in, in that regard as well. Go ahead. Yeah, if I can build on it. I, all of that Evan, is, is so spot on. It's sort of like what you're saying about uh, Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire, but it's that comedy, that it, written comedy or com comedy poetry, whatever type, has its type of rhythms, and music has its type of rhythms, but the space where the two overlap is actually very small. So that's what's hard. So we might, more often than not, we write songs from the funny idea or a funny lyric, and very rarely from a piece of music that becomes funny. There's just a very specific set that can serve both things. Well, one of the things that I thought was, oh, go ahead, because you, you clearly had a thought. Oh, no, because I, I know, I imagine you guys too, like, do you place jokes in songs where you know there will be a break for people to laugh so they don't step on the next joke? Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's everything. Timing's everything. <laughs> Timing is everything. Uh, another thing that I think is actually uh, uh, kind of funny is taking a song that is not natural, that is not in and of itself funny, but making it funny because of the context. And uh, Jonathan, one of the, the baby got back. <laughs> Which is freaking hilarious, because you do it as a sensitive songwriter thing uh, when it starts off as this, you know, just great high energy rap song. It's just the fact of changing the mode of the, of the uh, presentation of the song is in and of itself funny. Sure, and, and, and let me say that I was not the first to do that. There were, you know, that I stole that idea from several other people uh, who had taken hip hop songs and done them in a, in a very sensitive way. Uh, right, but sensitive. you're the only one that's here. No, that's true. Uh, and, and I will say that the, I'll credit my, my wife, Christine, for, uh, for uh, making me cover that song. She's always yelling at me to cover this song or that song. Um, and this time, she was absolutely right. She's never been right again, but that was the time. <laughs> That was the time when she was absolutely right, and, and what, what convinced me was that I, I had never really listened to the song all that closely before, but she, she somehow knew all, knew all the lyrics. Uh, and, uh, and what convinced me was that that song is, is really, um, uh, you know, it's a song about liking big butts, which sounds hilarious. But it really has a very positive message about uh, body image and... Uh, <laughs> I know, it sounds, it sounds like I'm being facetious, but I'm not. And so I think one of the, for me, one of the reasons that song worked as a genre-bending cover is that the making it a, 
a sensitive white guy, folky white guy, singing about it uh, in this really heartfelt way, to me, pulls that message out uh, and makes it a lot more plain than it was for me when I was listening to it, uh, you know, on, on the radio, driving to the beach or whatever. It, it's it, and so something about something about the intersection of that really heartfelt uh, and and touching sentiment um, and and this sensitive, pretty, uh, folky white guy. It, for me, that was a really nice uh, nice marriage of aesthetics. There also aren't, aren't a lot of sensitive white guy songs about butts. I feel like that's... Uh, uh, I'm trying to think if there's another one at all. Uh, fat Bob and Gross? That's very sensitive. Which one? Fat Bob and Gross. We're wandering. If I can build on that, the other thing that makes that song so effective for me and, and what seems to be one of Jonathan's superpowers uh, when it comes to writing funny songs that are great is because... <laughs> funny songs that are great. <laughs> but, you know, there, you get the con when, and this goes, I think, for any comedy song. Uh, for me, is the joke is there, the juxtaposition, like the source of any humor is just here's this unexpected thing, and okay, that was you know, that was some surprise, that was funny, that was great. The jokes in a comedy song generally hold up a couple of listens through, and if there's nothing else behind it, it's going to lose effectiveness quickly. And uh, Baby Got Back, and every damn song that Jonathan writes. Whether or not it's funny, it's a really good song. Like Baby Got Back is, it's beyond just the setting that's the you know, folky white guy. It's a beautiful melody, it's a wonderful arrangement of that song. And that's the thing we certainly always strive for when we're trying to write songs is, we want it to be funny, but more than that, we want it to be a good song because it's got to stand up to repeat listenability. Yeah. Um, that's for, for us what makes it really effective. And then it's great when it's funny on top of that, but it is just as important, if not more important to us, that it be, be flat out a good song. Whatever that means, you know, it's pretty, it's effective, it grabs people, it, it speaks emotionally, just the, the melody and, and the arrangement and whatever is underneath it. And I will say that, uh, thank, first of all, thank you, that's very kind. And I think you guys, all, everybody here does a great job of actually writing songs when you're also writing a comedy song. And a, a pet peeve of mine, is the kind of congratulations to all this high friends all around. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But a pet peeve of mine is is a, a comedy song where it's clear that somebody had the had the joke, had the funny idea, and started to write a comedy song and didn't actually get to the point of writing a song. It drives me nuts because it just it just it doesn't get there. It doesn't it doesn't ever land. All you have is the all you have is the joke. And as you said, the joke doesn't play more than a couple of times. And the, the, real, the real power of comedy songwriting is in the song part. And if you can accomplish that, then you've made something that is really complete and it's gonna last and it's gonna work on multiple levels. And wow. it's, it's so much greater than just telling a joke. I actually, I actually think this is why uh, Clever Girl by the Double Clicks is the perfect comedy song. <laughs> because it knows exactly how much song it needs to accomplish. Oh, good God, and it yes. the hell out. It's amazing, That's right. yeah. really skillfully executed. I'm going to ask them one more question, and they'll let them uh, go back and forth, and then we will open up to questions for, for you folks. Uh, remind